Welcome to the Sacred Dance Summit. I'm your host, Leslie Zare, the author of The Alchemy of Dance, Sacred Dance as a Path to the Universal Dancer. My guest today is Joana Sahira. Joana left her homeland, Portugal, to launch her career in Egypt. No maps or guarantees, just a big dream and a vision, an exotic set of values, challenges, and treasures to be found. She knew as soon as she landed in Cairo, that was the place where she would rescue the essence of Egyptian dance, and so she did. Joanna performed with the best musicians of Egypt for almost a decade, collecting information and firsthand experience on the art of Egyptian dance, music, and culture. She also worked as teaching and choreography assistant of Mahmoud Reda, the father of Egyptian folklore, the genius behind the iconic Reda troupe. Soon she started to be invited to teach, perform, and lecture around the world. The time to share the treasure she'd been gathering in Egypt had arrived. Time and a total immersion in her craft has proved what Joanna has always felt. Egyptian dance is a multi-layered art form. It's a dance, a healing path, a self-discovery and empowerment tool, and a way of living. Joanna's work has been built upon this rediscovery. Aside from teaching around the world, she's written and published the book, The Secrets of Egypt, Dance, Life, and Beyond. And she created the Joanna Sahira's Online Dance School, a project that congregates a special dance community with a common goal to grow as dancers and human beings. Egyptian dance is also a sacred language that reunites body, mind, heart, and soul. In that sense, this art form develops self-love, our infinite creative potential, the sacred feminine, and the awareness that dance, as life, are more than what the eyes can see. Joanna's dream is to keep spreading the magic and benefits of Egyptian dance throughout the world. Welcome. Welcome, Joanna. Thank hey. you for joining me today. Um, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Joanna is joining us from Portugal, and I'm speaking to you from Egypt. So this time we're, we're a little bit closer. We're only two time zones away. So, so I get to speak to you in the daylight. <laughs> a nice change. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? How did you how did you come to dance to begin with? Well, I was born dancing practically because as far as I remember, uh, I danced even before I started studying classical ballet and that was at five years old. So it was already very, very early age. But before that, I was already dancing and putting up crazy monkey shows at home and in the nursery. I was a headache because I was just not only a dancer, you know, but the thing of the performance, like I needed to express myself. And that came at first through movement, even before I, I thought about the concept of dance. So for me, it was not dance. It was just what I did. I thought everybody did it, you know. So I, I can... I, what I usually say is that I was born dancing because that's what I feel. I never um, was not dancing. I don't remember a time when music didn't move me. I don't remember that time and neither my, my family. So I guess it came from within, you know, it came with me. But then you studied classical day after, after your sort of innate experiences with dance, then you went on to, to study <laughs> classical ballet. Yeah, innate experiences is a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, in Europe, uh, the, um, the venue parents usually use to develop a uh, child's skills when she or he shows inclination for dance is usually classical ballet. It's not that I chose classical ballet per se, but it was the most obvious uh, training my parents could think of. And I loved it. So yeah, I started with classical ballet and then went through all kinds of other dances as I grew up, but that was my base. And it couldn't be more important and it couldn't be more different from Egyptian dance, but we will okay. get there. It's a huge um, you know, uh, difference of worlds. 
one represents one thing and the other one represents the opposite. So it's very interesting how I started in one extreme of the line and I went all the way to the other extreme with Egyptian dance. Yeah. So but what I, brought you what brought you to Egypt? What what inspired you to to bring that journey here? Yeah, it is very unexpected even for me because I never had any interest in Egypt as I grew up. A lot of kids have, a lot of kids have, as you know, you know, at least about pharaonic Egypt, there are all sorts of interests people grow up with related to Egypt. I was not one of them. So it's very curious how suddenly, apparently, um, a simple festival, a dance festival, not an Egyptian dance festival, it was a, an international dance festival, awakened this call for Egypt in me. I had no idea I had it in me. I never thought about it. I never felt any interest in Egyptian dance. I never see, I never saw anyone doing Egyptian dance. So this was, I was already 19 years old. So, you know, I was practically an adult and um, it caught me by surprise and everything happened so quickly. From the moment I had the first contact with Egyptian music and dance. And then the moment I arrived to Cairo, it was a space of three, four months. And I never stopped. It was, you know, like a door that had been closed. And once it was opened, there was no stopping. It took everything with it, you know, and you I heard the call. Go. Yeah. 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 And I kept going, you know, I just kept going without knowing why. At the time I was studying to be an actress. So I was in the conservatoire and um, all my teachers were asking me, what the hell are you doing? You know, why this? Why suddenly? You know, you spend most of your time in Egypt. Why? You're an actress. You're studying to be an actress. You know, why this? And I didn't have an answer, but I just felt I had to go. I felt I had to, to study Egyptian dance. I felt I had to be in Egypt at that time. And I just followed what I felt without knowing what the hell am I doing, basically. But I think that's faith. I think, and I think it does, you know, our path does call us. And it's about having the courage to, to do it, which you, you did. I mean, I've heard your story that you just packed up and, and you came here. So yeah. um, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's the courage <laughs> and a little bit crazy, you know. It's, I think it's the mix, you know, of courage and faith and um, self-confidence. This is very important. So you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe you can do what you are proposing yourself to do without that that self-assurance i don't think you can go anywhere and you, i don't think you can persevere because one thing is taking the step towards your dream another thing is persevering when things go hard and things yeah. go hard so yeah it's uh you know it's a mix a mix between i think courage and the call and this conviction that if i didn't follow that voice that told me go I would not be happy and I would not be um, satisfied with myself. I would regret it later. I would have thought, why didn't I go? Why didn't I discover what was there for me? You know, so although it was not clear why I was being called to Egypt, I knew I had to go and the price of not following that voice was too high. It was too high. So. And I think in Egypt, you learn your lessons twice as hard so if you if you're on the right path and you're and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing or you're following something that you need to be here and you can only get it from here i think you you are accelerated through that and you learn it really quickly and you get a huge lesson but if you're if you resist then i think that's when you get slapped in the face and well it's not yeah. I usually say Egypt either either transforms you and makes you grow exponentially or it destroys you. Yes. There's no middle term. There is no middle term. I don't, I have never seen a middle term. So you either go all the way and you allow it to push everything, push all the buttons and test everything and, you know, um, open you up, you know, in terrible ways and in wonderful ways and you accept what is coming as a as a, a, a cycle of learning curves or it will crash you mm -hmm. it's a very very um as you know because you live in egypt you know very well what i'm speaking about i'm sure um 
if you resist it or if you point too many fingers, but if you don't take the experience in, always remembering that you're there for by your own choice, right? <laughs> Nobody yes. dragged you to Egypt. You were not born in Egypt. You <laughs> chose to be there. So if you choose to be in Egypt and if you are um, experiencing whatever you are experiencing and it's hard and it's making you grow and it's challenging you, it's because you wanted it and you need it, you know, and somehow you either embrace it and make the best of it or you will be destroyed. This is my experience. And yes, I've never seen it happening in any other way. And especially for dancers, as you know, because yeah. I can go, you know, working in a, in a company or to be a manager of a, a company or whatever. I went to be a dancer, which is probably the most polemic, um, badly interpreted um, profession in Egypt. I mean, it's, it's a very hot topic, you know, it's highly yes. problematic profession in Egypt. And I came without any information. I didn't know the language. I didn't know anyone. You know, I basically landed in Cairo and said, I'm going to make this happen by myself. I'm going to knock on doors. I'm going to collect musicians from the street, literally. And I'm going to make this happen. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. And of course, this will expose you to things you don't even dream of when you arrive. I had no idea. I knew it would be hard, but I had no idea what was about to hit me. And um, that's also an important part of dreaming and going for it, is that if we knew everything that was coming ahead, we would not move forward. <laughs> so it's good not to know. It's good not My to favorite know. quote from a movie is from uh, the movie Out of Africa, the world was created round so that we can't see too far ahead. Exactly. Because often, yeah, if we knew what was coming, and, it does, and transformation is not an easy process. It does take courage. And, you know, you have the dark night of the soul, and then that's when you transform. So I think that if you really want to transform, yeah. yes, courage I, is a huge I know point. a very pivotal moment, which um, I already wrote about in a book that, that will be uh, coming out hopefully this next year. And the pivotal moment was when I just arrived to Cairo and my mom had left because she came with me for 15 days and she had left. And I found myself alone in my apartment in Heliopolis. And it dawned on me that I was alone in one of the biggest, most chaotic cities in the world without anyone to lift me up, anyone to guide me, anyone to give me any light. It dawned on me that I had a huge project in my hands that I had no idea how to turn into reality. It dawned on me that it was forbidden at the time for uh, foreign oriental dancers to work. So that was also adding to the a drama. big challenge. Yeah, yeah, the big challenge. Everything, you know, that was so ethereal and everything that was so in the dreamland suddenly came to me as a reality. And I just fell to the ground and I cried totally alone. I never felt more lonely in my life and totally powerless. And I woke up early morning lying on the living room of my empty house. And I realized it's now or never, you know, this, the strength that I will need to make this happen, it's within me because there's nobody here to lift me up if I need. Nobody will give me an answer. Nobody will knock on my door and offer me what I want nobody will knock on my door and say, Joanna, come, we will help you. Nobody, nobody. And that moment of realization that, okay, it's me I have to resort to. It's me I have to grab. It's, it's me that has to lift me up. It's me that has to find the resources to make this happen. I don't know how, but I have to. And that moment was, I think, the moment I became an adult even. You know, it was very, very important. And it was the first lesson amongst many that Egypt gave me. Yeah, yes. it was really hard, very hard and very important because that morning when I got up from the floor, I had all the strength of the world in me. It was, man, nobody would stop me. Nothing would stop me. But I think we do walk our path alone. We may have guides, but... Um, you do have to find that strength within yourself 
because it is your path and no one else will understand it either. I think we also, if others influence us too much, they're probably gonna take us off of our path. We're the only ones that can truly hear that call and really know what direction we need to move in. So as sure. much as it's lonely, I think it's also important because that we don't get off our path. Yeah, but you notice that so far I had, I had had the support of family and friends and boyfriend, you know, I, I had a very strong support system around me. And I've been living in Portugal, uh, between Portugal and Spain, because that's where my family was moving since I was born. And it was the first time that I saw myself totally alone in the sense of not having my support system and also being in a country that was very fascinating while I was traveling there to study. But suddenly living there and having to make a life there and having to build a career there all by myself without anyone around me, any hand, yeah. it, it really was terrifying. You know, when you think about it and you are far away and it's just an idea, it's just a dream, it's wonderful. But when you see yourself in the situation and you say, now what? Now what? No family, no friends, no nothing, nothing. And I walk in the street, you know, there's so many problems, as you know, suddenly this realization, I'm going to have to deal with all this by myself. I was 23, 22, 23. So I was very, very young and I had been very um, supported and shielded so far. Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, landing there in this circumstance and having no perspective of uh, doing what I was there to do, which was to perform. So as I mentioned, it was forbidden at the time. I didn't know it until I landed in Cairo that time. So that was also a big thing is that I'm here to do something that is illegal. How yeah. am I going to pull this off? And I had to survive and pay my bills for my work. I had no help from anyone and I could not work. How am I going to pull this off? You know, it's crazy. There's a way. <laughs> There's a way you just have to find it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's no, very strictly a way. And Egypt does test you. I mean, that's the thing. I think that Egypt is a magical place and to visit here and to visit the sites is important, but you don't really get it. You don't really get the transformation unless you stay here for a period of time. And then you're really in that alchemical vessel, yeah. that crucible and the heat is on. And I think that that's why the ancients, the ancient Greeks used to come to Egypt to study. They came and they stayed here for years. They didn't come for two weeks on a tour, which, you know, is, you know, it also does, is transformative, but it isn't like, like being here and really being in that, that pot. So, um, you know, yeah, Egypt, um, at least for me, it's very complex because I feel it is part of me. So I, I don't even, even feel that it's away from me. Um, it's an energy that I carry around. You know, I already carried it before, although I didn't notice, of course. And then when I left, I never really left. That's the truth. And even now people ask me, you know, do you miss Egypt? Do you want to go back? I said, I never left it. How can you miss something that you never left, you know? And what I feel about Egypt mostly, aside from something that was inevitable for me, is you mentioned the alchemy, right? You mentioned this transformation. You mentioned a place that provides experiences. If you dive into the life, of course, I mean, living in Egypt as an expatriate, dealing with foreigners in your protected, protected bubble is one thing. Living in Egypt with Egyptians, working with Egyptians, you know, totally immersed in the life of the country, that's another thing. And due to my work, the nature of my work, I was surrounded by Egyptians 24 hours per day. So my world was an Egyptian world, truly. I had very few contacts with foreigners. And that threw me into not only questioning my values, which was very hard because I grew up with a very strong mom who gave me very strong sense of values. What is right? What is wrong? What is sane? What is insane? Uh, what is good? What is bad? And suddenly Egypt pulls all the certainties off the box and says, no, 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 girl. 
it's not so easy and so simple as you think. So let's, let's <laughs> complicate this. Let's make you question those values. This is one thing. But another thing Egypt gave me that was very, very important, aside from the professional um, realm, let's say, aside from the career thing, was this um, going into this black black face, this nigredo, you mentioned alchemy, it's, it's something that I love very much and it's a subject that I'm very, very close to. And the nigredo phase, you know, this phase when we have to let things rot and let things die and see what's not working and face our own demons, face our own fears, face the things that we don't want to see. Egypt forced me to go there. You know, my experiences, both professional and personal, they forced me to go through this nigredo phase, through this phase that if I could choose, I would not go there. <laughs> Nobody wants to face their fears. Nobody wants, and I'm a kamikaze kind of person, you know. I mean, I'm not a coward at all. So, you know, even me, and I consider myself quite crazy in that sense that I will go forward, you know, I'm, I'm, I will not be stopped by fear. But I would not choose to face my fears and my insecurities and my, my demons the way the country itself forced me to do. You know, so it's, it's a very, very big alchemic oven, let's say. You know, it's how I could, I could summon Egypt up. You know, it's like an oven. And when you get yourself there, you're going to burn. And you're going to burn and you're going to, to see who you are, what you're made of, what you're really made of. It's not what you think you are, but what you are made of. It will test you again and again and again and again. I mean, daily, and you know that, daily. It's exhausting, but it's wonderful if you're there to learn and if you're there to grow and if you're there to challenge yourself and if you don't give your back to a good battle. Well, Egypt is the land of alchemy. That was the ancient name, Alchem, so... So yes, this is the place to come to transform, but you have to, you have to be ready for it. Or maybe it's better not to be ready. <laughs> it takes you by surprise and you just it do takes it. takes you by surprise. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, the reason why you go to Egypt is very important. You know, I've had many students asking me, you know, how is there and uh, how did you build your career and how did you do things? Do you think I should go? And my question is always, why do you want to go? Because the reason behind the, the desire to do something, it's for me, it's, it's very important. What is the reason? What is motivating you to go? Is that because you want people to know you were in Egypt? That's not, that's not enough. That's not interesting enough. Is that why? Why? What is calling you? You know? Um, and, and that makes a big difference. I was there not only to make a dream come true because I felt that I could grow as a dancer exponentially. If I had the opportunity to work with Egyptian musicians, this was my first vision. I wanted to work with the best Egyptian musicians there were. So this was the, the professional aspect of my dream. The other dream was I had this feeling without knowing why or how that it was through Egypt that I was going to rescue my path, heal a lot of things that I had to heal and recover stuff that was hidden behind the sand, you know, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. Uh, about myself and about Egyptian dance as well. About myself and about Egyptian dance. So I fell in love with the craft and, and somehow I knew that there was something to be recovered from there, you know, as if I was an archeologist. And I was going to go and dig, you know, but instead of tombs, I would look for something that is gradually being lost. So these were my main purposes and they were big purposes, you know, they were big things. They were bigger than myself. So it was not about, you know, uh, being known or, or, you know, having my name associated with Egypt because it's cool. It never crossed my mind. It was really bigger than myself. And because it was bigger than myself, it helped me pull a lot of things off. Because when you have to strong... ego out of the way. Yes. I think uh, that, that's also a big lesson of Egypt is that it does. It can break you and get your ego out yeah. of the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. 
violently. So let's, yes. <laughs> let's talk about Egyptian dance. What is Egyptian uh, dance? Maybe you can sort of, for those people who don't know, maybe you can give us a bit of a description. Yeah. So that's, as you know, also a very uh, complex question because it will depend who we're talking to. There are many levels of understanding of Egyptian dance, many levels of practice of Egyptian dance. But if I had to, to find a, a, simple, a simple answer, I would say, well, Egyptian dance, first of all, is a way of self-expression. There are many ways. Uh, Egyptian dance is one of them. It's also an organic, organic movement that developed into a dance form, like many other dance styles, okay? It's coming from Egypt, of course, as the name implies, and it's a dance that allows you to know yourself, to know your body, to know your emotions, and to express them as freely as possible. Although it's usually associated with seduction, seduction in terms of seducing someone, Egyptian dance has nothing to do with that. Egyptian dance has to do with the pleasure within myself, the pleasure in the movement, the pleasure of being alive, the pleasure of breathing, the pleasure of listening to the music and wanting to react to it, the pleasure of simply um, enjoying the experience. It's a very sensual dance, but not in the way people usually think. You know, because we have very narrow concepts of sensuality, very narrow and very distorted. So the sensuality of Egyptian dance that defines it a lot, it's not the only feature, but it's a very defining feature, has to do with me claiming the pleasure for myself. Me claiming the well-being and the experience of movement and expressing myself for myself, not for the other. Mm -hmm. Not to, 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 you know, as a target that is outside of myself. The target is me. I'm Which is a very feminine path. That's, that internal path is a very feminine path where the, it, isn't, it isn't about who's watching you. It's about what your own experience is. No, as a performer, as a performer, and this is what is very interesting, is that if you are a performer, and I've been a performer most of my life, you have the other watching, right? So you are not only enjoying yourself, you have an audience. And what happens is there is a big difference between dancing to reach your audience or dancing to connect to your audience. And I always work to connect in the sense of having the experience of the dance so fully and so truthfully that people who are watching me feel it. So they dance through me. They feel through me. I don't have to do anything for them to please them. Also because, you know, the role of art, in my opinion, is not to give people what they want. First, because you don't know what they want. You are not a mind reader. And even if you were, you have like, you know, 200, 1,000 people, 2,000 people in an audience. How can you please everyone? How can you know what everyone wants and go towards it? That's a crazy, insane task, you know? But what you can do is dancing and expressing yourself so truthfully and so freely that people can feel you and they can be inspired and they can be moved by your truthfulness. They can be moved by your vulnerability. They can be moved by your emotions. They can be moved by the experience that you're having there. And they can feel you because Egyptian dance is as much physical as it is energetical. So when you are seeing a, a true oriental dancer, most of what you will get as an audience is the energy. It's not what you visually capture, it's the energy. If she's an oriental dancer, I mean, real oriental dancer, what she will give you is goosebumps. It is not, oh, look how beautiful her body is, or look how beautiful her dress is, or look how beautiful her hair is, or look, look how many ticks and tacks she makes with her stomach. I mean, who cares? Who cares? You know, this is not interesting. This is not Egyptian dance. This is fluff, fluff nothing it's nothing so what you really get it's an energetic experience it's someone that is exhaling her own soul so freely so purely that it gives you goosebumps that's just dance you know so it is a fine balance between a dance that puts you in contact with yourself 
and the dance that allows you to connect with other people from a human and also divine perspective in the sense that the soul, which I consider divine, is the bridge that will make your audience feel you, you know, the soul or energy, you may call it wherever you want, but that, that soulfulness in the movement, that soulfulness in your face, and you can feel it when a dancer is, is moving from that place, from that core, you can feel it, you know, that's what makes Egyptian dance magical. And that's the definition of Egyptian dance. It's not a, an exotic gymnastic, you know, and it's not a competition thing. And it's, there's a lot of things happening right now in the world of Egyptian dance, some very positive and some very destructive. And the destructive ones are totally um, the opposite of what Egyptian dance is. And there are very good examples as a contrast to what we don't want Egyptian dance to be, which is, you know, a very aggressive, masculine, uh, uh, hurried, uh, overdoing kind of thing, uh, competition oriented, uh, clone oriented kind of thing. It's madness. You know, even the music nowadays is faster and faster. You know, I've received music from composers working today and I have a heart attack just listening to it because it's so fast. Yes. And, and, you know- I and, call that taxi driver music. <laughs> oh God, it's crazy. And, you know, it's not that I don't love it every once in a while, but the core of Egyptian dance must be re respected. And uh, when you don't have time, for instance, in the music, there is a misunderstanding. There is something that composer did not understand about Egyptian dance, which is Egyptian dance gives you time. It gives you time to listen. It gives you time to breathe. It gives you time to sit back and receive and react. This is why it's feminine. When we speak about feminine, it has to do with receptivity. But you cannot receive without time. If you are rushing, if the music is pushing you to rush and run and go like a crazy uh, monkey all over the place, you know, there is no time to feel. There is no time to receive. So the core of the dance disappears immediately. You are not connected with yourself and you are not receiving. You're just exhaling. You're not inhaling. And of course, there's a lot of beautiful things in the dance that cannot happen when the music is too fast or when people are oriented for competition, when people are taught to compare themselves to others. Mm -hmm. and to be better than, that's, that's not what Egyptian dance is. You know, it's... It's about individuality. It's about finding who you are and expressing who you are. And it has nothing to do with other people, you know. Let them be. Let them be. And you be yourself. And we inspire each other. But you're not supposed to be like me. I'm not supposed to be like you. I'm, I'm not supposed to compare myself to you or vice versa, you know. It's all about becoming more of who we are and connecting with each other, coming from that authenticity place. That's what Egyptian dance stands for. So how do you think women can benefit? Like, what is the real benefit if someone wants to come and take a class with you? How do you, what do you think that they're, they're going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. So as I, as I started mentioning, Egyptian dance has many levels. You will find Egyptian dance for people who want to lose weight. You know, you, you will find Egyptian dance for people who just want to have fun. You know, they like the music, they like the rhythms, they like percussion, and they just want to have fun. Then you have people who want to learn the craft. They really want to learn the dance. And that's where I'm in. That's, that's my universe. So what they can earn, first of all, is the contact with a fascinating world. You know, I often tell my students that learning Egyptian dance is not only about learning movements. It's about learning, you know, about Egypt, about a culture, about a language, about a history about so many things that have nothing to do with movement. So when you are introduced to Egyptian dance, what you gain is a new world. This is the first thing, okay? The second thing is the obvious physical benefits. I mean, and I, I think everybody has an idea that practicing any kind of dance, any kind of physical activity is good for your health. That's okay, that's, that's a predictable. What people usually don't know is that Egyptian dance, aside from working physically, is a path for self-knowledge and self-empowerment and self-esteem and higher creativity and a higher sense of 
who you are and how much you can do creatively. And I don't mean only in dance, I mean in everything. Because when you, when you get empowered in dance, you get empowered in life. And this is what is most, the most interesting thing about teaching Egyptian dance is that I know if I'm doing it right, I am building people's inner strength for everything, not only for the dance field. You know, when, when there is a moment when a, a person is in a class, online or presential, and she or he realizes, wait a minute, I can do this. I am creative. I have something unique in me. Oh my God. You know, that moment is something that goes beyond the dance class. It goes way beyond the workshop. It's an awakening that can change that person's life, literally. You know, when they realize I'm more than I thought I was, I'm actually more creative, I'm stronger, I'm more sensitive, I'm more able, I'm braver than I thought. Oh my God, now what do I do with this? And for me, this is the most fascinating part about teaching Egyptian dance. It's what goes beyond the dance class. You know, and, and I think it's the, the best thing students can get from Egyptian dance, aside from, of course, the beautiful movements, the great choreographies, you know, aside from also developing your sensuality. And I mentioned that before. So you have this um, healthier sense or concept of sensuality that is uh, hopefully uh, developed when you learn Egyptian dance. And what does that mean? It means that you get to know your body, you get to know your muscles, your bones, what feels good, what doesn't feel so good, what's hurting, why it's hurting, why you're more flexible here, why you're less flexible there. You get to know yourself physically, but also you get to know yourself emotionally. You know, because there are so many things that will come to the surface when you start to develop Egyptian dance and, and you start to dance on a certain level, you will, you know, you will smile, you will cry, you, everything will come to the surface, you know, you will find new ways of using your mind. You know, I often say Egyptian dance is, is a connection between body, mind, heart, and soul. And it is. So as a student of Egyptian dance, you will find yourself using your mind in ways that you didn't, you didn't use before. And you will find yourself moving from that soulful place you didn't even know you had. So it's really like, you know, of course, I guess it shows I love it very much. And um, when I speak about it, I speak from a personal point of view and from witnessing, you know, thousands of people that I've trained so far going through this so although it seems like a very uh, cute description very idealistic it's not idealistic it's very real it's actually very real and basically it can change a person's life you know it's not only something for fitness or for fun or not even only to know a new culture all those aspects are great but if you're gonna go deep into it and if you're gonna go deep into it with a teacher who has done the path you cannot teach what you have not lived. I don't believe in that. I believe you teach what you have lived. You That's need to walk the talk. Absolutely. Now. Absolutely. I, I stand by that 100%. I don't believe that you can, um, you know, teach except through example. Okay. So everything that I'm telling you is things that I lived and, and that I witnessed people living, you know, and it can really change a person's life. And it can make you more feminine, which is something I went through because I'm, you know, I'm, for, for nature, my own nature is very masculine, <laughs> which is funny because people don't associate me with that. But I'm very masculine. My energy is very masculine. You know, it's very go. It's very martial. You know, I have this Mars thing going on. And one of the aspects that Egyptian dance developed in me was, you know, bringing this feminine uh, attitude, not only to my dance, but to my life, which is in itself a revolution, you know? And yes, because I think that Western women are very masculine. I think when you come to, to Egypt or to the Middle East, you see a whole different description of what the feminine is. And again, I think immersing yourself in that is, is transformative. Yeah, you know, the feminine, the feminine, which is at the core of Egyptian dance, is another very complex subject. It's hard to put it into a few words. And nowadays, as you mentioned, you know, women are very masculine for many reasons that 
I think we are, we are all aware of. And I think there is a fine balance that Egyptian dance develops between the masculine and the feminine energies. But before it balances, it has to recover the feminine if it's in the fall. In my case, it was totally in the fall. Totally. Mine too. So, yeah. Totally. So I, I, know. I had the same journey to Egypt to reclaim my feminine because yeah. I didn't it, even know what that was. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't even know what that was. That's a very good way of putting it. Exactly. And what Egyptian dance does also is showing you the essence of the feminine. It's not only, you know, words. It's the essence. What is a feminine attitude? What do we speak about when we say it's feminine? What exactly are we speaking about, you know? And what I learned from Egyptian dance that students can learn gradually, and it's also a life-changing thing because it will change you, it will change your attitude towards everything, is that the feminine, it's not only the ability to be receptive as opposed to doing things and being out there, which is a very masculine thing. It's my comfort zone. You know, I'm the kind of person who would say, okay, let's do it. Ah, I'm gone. Ah, you know, this is, this is my natural tendency. So for me to sit back and say, oh, let's not do anything. Just well, let's see what comes and then let's receive and then let's transform this and use what you receive and go with the flow of what, of what we're receiving. Basically being open to life. No, instead of wanting to impose our plan and our will all the time, you know, and Egyptian dance developed that in me, I mean, brutally, brutally. And, and, and that is something that every student of Egyptian, of Egyptian dance can learn, you know, learning how to listen, learning how to be still, learning that power is not only the martial power of here I am and I'm going to do it and Power can be setting back, you know, sitting back mm -hmm. and waiting, sitting and back and watching things in as, as, as in a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Power can be vulnerability. Power can be loving instead of fighting, which was also a big thing for me because, you know, I grew up in, in tough environments and I was a fighter, you know, I'm a street girl at heart. So, I mean, what? Power is, <laughs> <ugly>? <laughs> you know, it's very strange for me. It's really like the opposite of every, everything I, I've ever known, you know? So it is not just a dance style, you know, and it is not just a, a dive into a, a world that is really fascinating. Egypt is fascinating, man. It's, it has so many layers and it has so many, you know, stages and it has so so much wisdom so much knowledge i mean it, it's incredible but mostly what i think people earn and that i've been earning you know ever since i started doing egyptian dance is this transformative personal journey of becoming more whole becoming more balanced and becoming more human ultimately balancing this yin and yin and yang no, this masculine and feminine, when you know when to sit still, you know when you go and fight for it, you know when to remain silent, you know when to speak, you know, this fine balance, which is the hardest in everything, of course, the middle path, no, this bridge here, it's what ultimately Egyptian dance develops in you. And that's, it's, it's, it's life changing journey, you know, and it never ends. Aside from this creativity aspect of the dance, which has to do with a movement that is so organic, that is constantly inviting you to rediscover yourself. And how much can I do with this movement? How much can I do with this pattern? How much can I do with this little detail? How can I change this movement to something slightly different and the result will be completely different? No, I work with patterns with, with students. We work with geometrical patterns, sacred geometry. And I always ask them to redesign things and start using their imagination and draw things in their head and then put them, translate them in their bodies, you know, like children. Somehow you rediscover your body and how much you can do in terms of movement and sensations and emotion like a child. And this is, it's endless. And it's infinite. 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> we said that together. Yes, yes it's infinite. <laughs> exactly. It never ends, you know, it never ends. And it's really, really beautiful. And of course, you know, there is an aspect of Egyptian dance that I cannot pinpoint in words. And that's very frustrating for me because I love to put everything in words. <laughs> <laughs> the word for something, it freaks me out. Like, what? I need a word for this. But there is an aspect of Egyptian dance that I think you cannot put into words. And I've only experienced it with my musicians in Egypt. Uh, it's something that you have to live in the country with the musicians of the country in the field in the spot and which is a total opening of the heart um, in the book that i published the secrets of egypt i i speak about three gates for egyptian dance uh, the first gate is the ear so learning how to listen, the feminine aspect that we were talking about, being receptive to the sound, being receptive to your breath first, that's the first music. No? If you cannot listen to your breath, you cannot listen to music. So the first you are receptive to your own breath, then you are receptive to the music. That's the first gate is the ear. It's not the movement. The second gate is the heart. So you imagine the heart as a filter, as a, a place, like a storage house where the sound comes through and it awakens whatever has to be awakened and it throws off whatever has to be thrown off and it transforms it into movement. So the second gate is the heart. The third gate is physical movement, if there is physical movement. But the first two gates, the ears and the heart, are the essential. They are the most important things. And there is this aspect of Egyptian dance that is very hard to put into words. It has to do with the heart. It's heart opening. It's heart crashing. It's heart lifting. It's heart... I don't know. I, I, the, the word. <laughs> I, I haven't found the word, but I will find it. I will find it. I will find it. If anyone will find it, you'll I find, find it. it. I will find it. <laughs> but so far, it hasn't come. It hasn't come. But there Fine. Is. You described it. That, that's good. Just maybe, maybe it's beyond words or beyond a word. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. So let's talk a little bit about Lilith. You speak about Lilith in relation to Egyptian dance. So first, explain who Lilith was for people who don't or what archetype that is for people who don't, are not familiar with that. This is one of my favorite themes, actually, and it's another complex polemic theme. Uh, by now, you must have noticed all of the subjects connected with Egyptian dance are polemic <laughs> and complex uh, because they move so many prejudices, you know, and they move so many fantasies and myths and old stuff, old garbage. It, it, it's we would have to clean the house completely and then start from, you know, start building those concepts all over again in order to get these things out there completely clear, completely obvious to people. But in, in relation to Egyptian dance, the figure of Lilith is essential and it's very misunderstood. So Lilith was the first wife of Adam. I would not call her wife, I would call her partner, partner. And she was considered equal to Adam. And she claimed her freedom, her individuality, and her right to pleasure as much as Adam. And he didn't like that. He wanted to impose his will upon her. And basically she said, man, Arrivederci, I'm off. <laughs> if you don't have the same rights as I do, if I don't have the same rights as you do, if you claim your, your individuality if you claim your pleasure if you claim your identity but you don't allow me to claim mine i'm off this is not for me so she left she left paradise and she left adam and she became damned and then came eve the domesticated wife out of adam's rib so she was a part of she was not a unit she was not an individual she was a part of adam so she obeyed and she allowed Adam to define her. So from this description, you can get a little glimpse of the connection between Lilith and Oriental dance or Egyptian dance. 
An oriental dancer is an individual. An oriental dancer is connected with Lilith in the sense that she claims the power of her full self. She claims the power for her own mind. She claims the power for her own soul, her own heart, her own sensuality, her own body. She owns herself. Not only she owns herself, but she expresses herself without limits or taboos. There is no um, forbidden emotion in Egyptian dance. And this is one of the things that makes it so special and so different from other kinds of dances. You know, and as I mentioned, I studied different kinds of dances and I love different kinds of dances, but no, no style will allow you the freedom to express yourself so freely as Egyptian dance. So Lilith here is connected with Egyptian dance in the sense of being a symbol of a woman who is fully in herself. You know the expression full of yourself that is usually, usually um, applied to someone in a pejorative way, right? We usually say, oh, he's too full of himself or she's too full of herself as a critic, not as a compliment. But being full of yourself is actually a good thing. You know, I mean, you, you shouldn't be full of somebody else, I hope. I mean, you, you're going to be full of, of whom? You know, your neighbor? That's weird. You know, you're, you're going to be full of yourself in the best sense of the word as an oriental dancer and as Lilith in the sense of owning yourself. Who am I? How do I feel? How do I think? What do I want to express? How do I want to connect with people? What gives me pleasure? What gives me joy? What makes me sad? What? It's about a personal quest of the self. Who am I? And how can I express myself truthfully and inspire others to do the same by doing so? And this is Lilith. You know, it's absolute Lilith. It's about individuality. It's about a non-compromising statement. This is who I am. And this is how I express myself. And this is what I have to say. And this is what I have to share with the world. This is Lilith. And it's a shame, you know, that Lilith, like many mythological figures, has earned such a, a negative connotation. Because then again, you know, throughout history, uh, women were not allowed to be their full selves. They were like an appendix of men. They were, you know, a part of, they were like the... the the supporting role, supportive role. They were never the main role. And what Lilith and what the concept of being an oriental dancer brings to the table is woman, woman which, who is not in the place of a supportive role. It's in the main role. It's me owning myself, owning my life, owning my dance and expressing my sensuality, which is a very dear subject to Lilith in a totally natural and free way. Not to please Adam, Adam as a metaphor for men, but as a way to express myself in that sense, amongst many other senses, is it exactly as I am. No. That's Lilith, you know, it's freedom. It's the wild woman. It's also the concept of wild woman, the best possible term. What is wild is undomesticated. It's someone who is not tame. He's someone who is in contact with her nature with her true self and is not compromising that in order to please other people or to fit in. So this is a revolutionary place to be in anywhere, but in Egypt for sure, where there is a patriarchy still ruling the game. So a woman who is not only in charge of herself, but let's say in professional terms, I was managing my own orchestra, right? I was managing technicians and assistants and a woman in charge of herself and in charge of a group of men. <laughs> this is totally, totally uh, outside of the box, you know, totally outside of the box. And even in the West, and we consider ourselves very developed and ahead, and in many ways we are, but we're not so much, not so much more developed than the East in some aspects. Even in the West, when you speak about Egyptian dance or Oriental dance, or when you dance for people, you know, in the West, you will find them very <laughs> awkward, you know, and having epileptic attacks and such, you know, because it's an energy of freedom and it's an energy of uncompromising truth. This is very disturbing. And this is Lilith. 
you know it's yeah. very disturbing for people it's very it's a lot of fun to see the reaction <laughs> yes people are not expect don't expect to see people who are empowered no no they no don't, exactly they don't know how to react to that yeah exactly and p and you know it's this question of you being yourself and dancing from that place of truthfulness and not giving a damn about what people think that's power too you know it's that you're yeah. so comfortable in your own skin that you are moving, you are expressing yourself without any concern. Oh, they don't want to see this. Oh, they are expecting that. Oh, I should not behave like that. Oh, I should not show this emotion. Oh, I should not do this. Oh, I should not. But you then know. it's not an expression. It's a... Oh, but yeah. Kind of a, yeah, but you would think, yeah, you would think it's very common, but unfortunately it's not. Freedom is yeah. the least common trait trait you will find you know it, it's very rare to see a, a free dancer you know i've i've been yeah. traveling and, and teaching all over the world for the past years and judging in competitions and such and what i mostly see is people who have been trained to fit the mold and everybody is moving the same way everybody's looking the same way even yeah. you know, the hair is looking the same the makeup's look it's like clone machine factory and so, in the end that's really boring as well it's very discouraging, very boring, uh, not stimulating at all, but it is what it is. You know, it's the reality. And I think it's also part of evolution, you know, of Egyptian dance. I mean, 10 years ago, you didn't have all the international festivals you have right now. Yeah. So that's a good thing is that the West has taken over in the sense of making it more professional and more serious. Um, there is so much more vocabulary added to the dance and choreographic skills and so many wonderful things added. But at the same time, there are setbacks. There are aspects that I don't consider evolution. And one yeah. of them is the clone machine factory going on. It's the competition. It's the, this formatting of people that do not allow them to dance from that true place of self. That, yeah. that I think is at the core of Egyptian dance. So there are, you know, like in every evolution, I think there are things that pulls it forward and things that pulls it backwards. And, mm -hmm. but we're moving on, you know, and I think although some aspects of Egyptian dance are getting lost, others are getting um, improved. And there are not a lot of teachers, but some teachers who know the essence of Egyptian dance who, and who are truly teaching it and making an effort to keep it alive, you know, and making an effort to educate people not to look like each other and not to compete with each other all the time and not be this struggle for who's the biggest diva in the room that has very little to do with Egyptian dance in its head. You cannot dance from your ego, from your vanity and from your soul at the same time. It's just not possible. So you have to choose. You either are trained to dance like the big diva in the room and then you're not going for egyptian dance it's something else or you say all right let's forget all this nonsense and let's really go inside and see what's there and move from there and that's a totally different path and that's the path of egyptian dance at least the egyptian dance i know uh, that's the egyptian dance i know and that's what i think few teachers not many, unfortunately, but a few teachers are, are going for, and that will keep the dance alive. You know, that will keep the dance alive and thriving with distortions, of course, because they are already there, but um, with the essence still preserved somehow. But people have to choose that. You know, if they, if they want the depth, then they have to choose a teacher like you that that's going to show them that. And if they want just choreography and maybe they don't want to show themselves. I think sometimes that's the problem is that with certain kinds of dance is that someone doesn't want everyone to see her soul. They want her to be the most perfect at doing a certain move. So those are the choices I guess that the dancer makes. Yeah, that is, that is a very interesting thing, you know, and, and there is also always a choice, you know, when, let's say when I'm training more advanced dancers <clears throat> and we're working on a complex choreography and there is an interpretation being required, let's say, it's always the choice, as you mentioned, to expose yourself or not to expose yourself. And what I find is that many times people want to expose themselves in the sense of 
being comfortable with the, with exploring and expressing what they truly feel, but they don't know how to do it mm-hmm. for many reasons. They can't, you know, they're not used to express their emotions, for instance. That happens in many cultures, you know, Japan, China, you know, you have some of the best technical dancers in the world in China and Japan, but they have a struggle with expressing emotions because of their culture. So there are many aspects to not being able to express yourself emotionally. And there are people who simply don't want to. And I think it's their right not to want to, you know. So that's a very interesting thing is that although my work goes toward giving you the strength and the comfort to say, I can express myself fully and allow others to see me in my most intimate feelings, in my most intimate places. And I can be safe with that. And I can have this level of trust in myself and in others that allows me to be totally vulnerable. Yeah. But at the same time, giving you the right not to go there if you don't want. Because it's all, always your choice, always the choice of the student you know, to go to those places or not, to explore and express those places or not. It's not my decision to make. It's, it's my job to create uh, uh, the tools and to give you the tools to go there if you want. But then it's always your choice. But of course, you know, it's a question of free will and each person deciding how much they want to take from the dance and how deep they want to go. That is not the decision I will make. It's a decision students make. And it's an expression of themselves, you know, some, some people that's, they're out there they, and they want to put themselves out there and other people maybe want to keep it for themselves. So that sure, for sure. finds them as well. You know, it, just to add a little spice here, although it, it is everybody's right to decide, let's say, I just want to dress up. I want to have a nice wig. I want to have a nice makeup and be perfect all. It is your right to decide this and to choose this. But if you do so, you have to know you're not doing Egyptian dance. This is what pisses people off, you know what I say? <laughs> yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, it pisses people off. But it's I've, I've had people leave my classes because <laughs> yeah, yeah. they don't like my philosophy, but... That's yeah, fine too. You know, but the thing is, I'm speaking not from my imagination. I'm speaking from my direct experience. So when I tell you this, it's not just what I think. It's actually the, the, the information I've recovered from the field. You know, I didn't have it in a dream or whatever. You know, I actually spent almost a decade of my life working with the best people in Egypt, you know, dancing for Egyptians every day. So I have a, an idea of what I'm talking about, yes. you know. I have an idea. So it is not a personal opinion. You know, it is something that I always clarify. And I say to students, look, it's fine. But first, you are more interesting than that. And this is a big point because many women choose to go for the perfect doll kind of thing because they believe they have nothing else to offer. They believe that's what they have to offer. And that's very sad. And my job as a teacher is also to show them, look, you have more to offer than that. You are more than that. You know, you may not want to see it. You may not want to go there. That's your right. But it's my job to show you, you are more than that. And, it's and also I think that's a big role for a teacher is just to hold space for the student to allow them to express who they are or, or to even find out who they are because absolutely. they may not know. Absolutely. Or to choose evolution or not. You know, I, I may show you, look, I will show you in different ways that you're more creative than you think you are. I will show you in different ways that you're more intelligent than you think you are. I will show you that this perfect doll image does not make you justice. Even if I show you this, you may not want to explore those parts of yourself. You will tell me, no, I'm comfortable as I am. I just want to dress up and have a nice video on YouTube and have people like me. And who am I to say no? Of course, I say, go for it. Well, it's part of the journey. Absolutely. Or their journey, yes. Absolutely. You know, it's just that Egyptian dance is such a, a, an incredible growth tool, an empowering tool, that it can be frustrating for a teacher when students don't take that tool into their hands and use it. But I think it's also part of the maturity of the teacher to accept that not everybody will use those tools. 
and they may use them later. Yes, absolutely. They may not in the moment that you're teaching, but you know, years later when the time is right, they have those tools and, and they can use them. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Respecting people's time, you know, mm -hmm. Respecting people's time and just laying out the information, uh, opening them up, but allowing them to see what they want to do with it right now. And if, if they really want to go for it right now or not, yeah. you know, uh, recently, I was teaching a course on uh, Om Kalsum, and um, we were working in a very emotional dance piece. And there is one of my best students. She was telling Joanna, but do I have to expose myself that much? I mean, do I have, I say, honey, you don't have to. But the question is, the music is very personal. And there is a storyline. So there is already a, a, a script that you as a dancer have to interpret. That's the level we're moving on. How can you interpret an emotional storyline without being emotional and without showing your emotions? How can you do that? You know, it's a very tough uh, crossroads that dancers will find if they grow and they evolve in their dance, if they go beyond the one, two, three turn, one, two, three turn, you know, the basic stuff they will find themselves in a point of evolution of the dance that you cannot move forward if you don't open your heart. You yeah. just can't, you'll be stuck. You'll be stuck. And I say, honey, you can if you want and you can make justice to the music and really go deeper into yourself and, and find the strength in vulnerability or you can choose not to go there but you will not be making justice to the music. You will not be interpreting the music you will be repeating a nice choreography. It's a choice. And then, you know, everybody will, will go to different places, comfortable and comfortable when they're ready, if they want to. But it's my job to provide the conditions for them to jump. Yeah. You know? and so, and then let them use it if they want, as they want, you know, as they can, because sometimes, as I mentioned, people want to, but they, you know, how many of us have lived all our lives unable to express emotions? Oh my God, you know, due to our culture, due to our education, due to wounds that we gather, you know, due to fear of rejection, due to the fear of other people not liking us. If we are, you know, totally exposed emotionally, how many of us? I mean, it's, it's rare. I, I don't know a lot of people who can express their emotions truthfully and kindly and generously. You know, how many people can say to each other, I love you? You know, like, hi, Leslie, good morning. I love you. I appreciate you, you know, and being comfortable with this, you know, not, not a lot of us. So there is this aspect of Egyptian dance that also deals with the wounds that we bring and our inability to feel and to express due to many things, many reasons that we carry around, you know, like stored. In that sense, of course, it's a healing process as well, but you have to want to take that. You know, you have to want to take the medicine. You have to want to... Well, it takes courage, as you, as you said in the beginning. It, it takes courage to do that. But I think yeah. by offering someone a way to do it, you know, maybe we don't know how to express our emotions, but you offer them a vehicle to do that at that point where they find the courage, then they have the tools to actually to express seen, themselves you know, and to be seen and appreciated for who they really are because there is this very deep fear that we are not good enough and we are not interesting enough and if we expose ourselves as we really are people will not think much of us they will not like us they will not approve us they will not applaud us there is this lack of esteem very deeply ingrained and very universal unfortunately and what we can do as teachers, and I do that in Egyptian dance all the time, and I love it because there's nothing more pleasurable than seeing someone, you know, seeing, oh, I'm, I'm interesting. Oh, if, if I really show you who I am, you actually like me, and you see I'm beautiful, and you see I'm fascinating, and you see I'm unique. Oh, really? It, and it's beautiful when you see that happening you know, and when you allow people to bring their heart to the table and having a way to tell them, you're beautiful, 
go on, show me more. Don't hide. Don't hide, you know. Take off those masks. Just go on. It's beautiful. Now you're dancing. Now it's happening. Now it's magical because it's you. And I see you, man. I see you. And you're beautiful. Don't be afraid. You're beautiful. Come, show me. Come closer. And this process is, is you know, it's one of the things that gives me more pleasure in teaching. And it's one of the things that I believe it's, probably the most precious thing in, in Egyptian dance, you know, it's that it rescues your own humanity and your own sense of self-value and your own sense of security and confidence in who you are and confidence in others that if another human being sees you for who you really are, they will see themselves in you and they will connect with you and they will appreciate you and they will receive you and embrace you in their heart. And this is, I don't see anything more interesting than this. You know, I, I cannot see. There's so many beautiful, fascinating subjects, you know, in the world. But what can be higher than this? You know, a, a, a tool that allows you to be human, you know, absolutely human. And to see your sense of self-worth and consequently seeing the worth in others because this will have a consequence. It's not only something that affects you, it will affect the way you see others. You know, someone who is fully empowered in the sense of, um, I know that if I expose myself, you will see me and you will appreciate me. So I have nothing to hide. You know, this is who I am. Take it or leave it, you know. This person will inspire others to do the same. Mm -hmm. And this person who appreciates herself or himself will appreciate others. And the opposite is also true. I say this to my students many times, and this is why developing strong self-confidence in dancers is so important. It's not only for their own sake, it's for the sake of everybody. Someone who hates themselves will hate other people. If you cannot give love to yourself and appreciate yourself, you will not be able to give love and appreciate others. No way. You know, we, you know, need a, we need a world of empowered and well-centered people within themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. For themselves and for others. You know, mm -hmm. there is this saying that I heard from Maya Angelou that I love very much. And there is this beautiful poetry reading on YouTube. So it's a suggestion to make if you can check it. It's really wonderful. And she says, um, I think it's an African saying. It goes, don't believe a, a naked man who offers, uh, offers you a shirt what does this mean? You know, you cannot give what you do not have for yourself. And this is a very dangerous thing because if you have a world of people full of self-hatred, people who don't really love themselves, people who are not comfortable with who they are, these people will not allow others. Yeah. You know, and these people will hate on others. These people will criticize others. These people, you know, how many criti critics you see, you know, people are so quick to criticize but they're not so quick to do. That's easier than facing yourself. But yes, I think any practice that brings you back to yourself and your depth. Criticizing is easier than doing, of course. Mm -hmm. So what Egyptian dance does in a very subtle way, in very beautiful ways, that it really throws you back in. It mm -hmm. It's always throwing you back to yourself. To looking at yourself, yes. Looking at yourself, you know, looking at yourself and dealing with yourself and who am I and how much can I do and what do I have to say, what do I have to express and again, how can I be more human? How can I use my mind more, my heart more with my mind? How can I use my body more, not only physically, but how many sensations can I bring out of this body? How much comfort and pleasure and joy and ideas can I bring out of myself, my physical body, my mental body, my emotional body, my spiritual body? How much can I love myself in a way that allows me to show myself exactly as I am all the time? Not only when I'm dancing, see, all the time. And by doing that, not only inspiring others to do the same, but being more loving towards others. You know, like if I'm a woman who loves her body, let's say, let's grab a very specific example, okay? Uh, 
as a, a dance teacher, you will find people with body issues all the time, right? I'm too fat, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I don't like it. Da, da, da. And if you have a woman who truly loves her body, this woman will most probably enter in contact with other women in the sense of making them feel good about their bodies. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is also true. If she's have, not projecting <laughs> her issues onto everyone else. Yes. Well, actually, she's projecting the positivity. She's not projecting the negativity. On the other side, if a woman who hates her body, who does not like, who is critical, highly critical of her body, rest assured, this is the kind of woman who will point fingers, oh, your thighs are too big, you should be on a diet. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, absolutely. So when we speak about self-esteem, and when I say that, you know, Egyptian dance develops this self-assurance, it's not only for the person, it's for everybody. Everybody gains from this, you know, because then again, someone who is comfortable in their own body will make others comfortable in their own body. You know, someone who trusts their intelligence will be empowering towards other people in that sense. You know, if I believe I'm intelligent, if I like my mind and I do, I love my mind, it's a headache, but it's also miraculous. It produces so many wonderful things. So if I have the self-assurance in my intelligence, for sure, when I come in contact with other women, and I speak about women because they are our direct mirrors, but I could speak about men and women. I will see intelligence in others. I will see intelligence in others because I see it in myself. Mm -hmm. It's very active. It's active. It's, it's, it's dominant. Yeah. If I am comfortable with my emotions, my heart, I will make others comfortable with their emotions and their hearts. You know, so it, it goes like that. It is not only something or a set of skills that we use for dance. It is not only a set of skills we use for ourselves. It's a set of skills that affects everyone in the dance class and outside of the dance class. It's a transformation. You're, you're, if, the, if the individual is evolving, then, then yes, they're Absolutely. changing themselves. Absolutely. So you have some, some things coming up now. Let's talk about that. You have a new, a new book coming out. Yes. So I'm always working on different things. Um, and uh, there are book projects that I'm finishing, but there is one that is finished and it's behind the curtain. It's a very special and very unexpected book because it was not planned. Uh, it is a collaboration between me and a Slovenian photographer. Uh, she photographed me three times um, in shows that I did in Slovenia, in festivals I was invited to. And in the fourth visit to Slovenia, we were um, having a, a, a wider project, let's say, a wider festival with live musicians. And we were talking and I told her, why don't you cover the backstage? Why don't you cover the rehearsals and the backstage? Because nobody photographs that. And, yeah. you know, why not? Because that's a very important part of the show. I mean, for me, it's probably the most important part of the show. It's what nobody sees. And it's the preparation. You know, it's like the seed for the flower that you see on stage. So why don't you just photograph backstage and, you know, the stuff usually nobody considers photographing? And she said, yes. And um, I didn't think it would um, develop into a book. I just thought it was a good idea because I love photography and, you know, just good idea. And then yeah. she's sending me the, the photos and I selected a few and I wrote in the moment. The moment I received the photos, I wrote stuff immediately. And I started collecting photos, selected photos and texts that I wrote for those photos. And suddenly I had a book. That's how it came. So I gathered the best texts and the ones I felt were meaningful and the best photos, the ones I felt were meaningful. And a, a book was born out of this very spontaneous collaboration. So it will be out in January, January 2019. Um, there are two other books that I plan on finishing in 2019. I will keep them for now <laughs> for me. Um, and Joana Saida's online dance school, my online dance school, will have a new platform. We've been operating 
for the last year, year and a half, we're still uh, babies, but it has been a very, very special uh, project for me. It has allowed me to have more time to write, which was one of my main goals, was to stop traveling so much because in the last years I, I didn't stop traveling. And that was wonderful because I was teaching, you know, lecturing and performing basically all over the globe. That's wonderful. But I didn't have the time and the mindset and the quietness that allowed me to write, which is an area I want to invest to. So creating my online school not only allowed me to gather a wider community of students that I met along the way in my travels, but also to keep teaching without leaving the same spot, allowing me to write. So that's one aspect. And the school is moving on now to a new platform, improved platform. We will have new courses coming up in January, uh, a very special course related with self-esteem and Egyptian dance. So there is a, a side of um, self-development that has been at the school from the beginning and now more than ever. So it is not just an online dance school. It's an online dance school that will allow you to develop your dance skills and grow as a person as well. It was always part of the goal, my vision for the school. Good. Yes, we'll look forward to, to seeing that. Yes. And yes. you have a, a special offer for mm -hmm. our listeners. You have an ebook that yes. they can download. Sure, it's an um, ebook that I created for my students at the school. And um, everybody who is interested in Egyptian dance, even if they're not at the school, it's called Welcome to Egyptian Wonderland. Okay, and it will give you it gives you it gives you a little um, a little idea of different aspects of Egyptian dance and self-development and why Egyptian dance can be a magical transformational tool. So it's a perfect, perfect uh, book to start. And a good even introduction. Dancer, yeah. Even you're a dancer because my perspective is very specific. So even if you are already an advanced dancer or professional, I am sure you will, you will learn new stuff in the book. So click on that link below the, the video and you can, you can get Joanna's ebook. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for speaking to us today. Yeah. And thank all the listeners for listening and please take advantage of Joanna's ebook. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the invitation, Leslie. It was wonderful to talk with you and a big kiss to everybody who is listening to us. Um, and let's have an amazing year, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's bring it into the, the new year. All yeah. right. Yes. Bye bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye, you're welcome.